Welcome and thank you for joining the webinar today. I'm Meg Balistrieri with Project Management at Tricom. Tricom is pleased to announce our Industry Insider webinar series. The purpose of the series is to share our expert knowledge and resources with our fellow staffing industry colleagues. Our presenters today are Jeff Tussel and Kurt Murray from Assurance Agency. Jeff is a principal at Assurance Agency and has been with the company since 2000. Jeff worked with the team at Assurance to focus on providing solutions to staffing companies, making Assurance the largest insurance broker to the staffing industry. Prior to Assurance Agency, Jeff was the Assistant Director of Workers' Compensation Underwriting of Safeco Insurance Companies. Jeff has served on the Board of Directors for the Wisconsin Association of Staffing since 2001 and is a frequent industry speaker at many conferences and events. Kurt is a principal of Assurance Agency and has been providing insurance solutions to the staffing industry for over 10 years. He is well versed in the unique risk management needs of the staffing industry and assists staffing businesses with their risk management programs. Kurt is focused on the big picture of profitability for his clients. As a result, Kurt makes sure they are aware of the appropriate services Assurance Agency has to offer. In addition, Kurt is able to recommend industry partners to help his clients maximize their profits. Assurance Agency is one of the top 100 insurance brokers in the United States and has specialized in insurance for the staffing industry since 1994. Their emphasis is on financial risk management programs for workers' compensation. In today's Industry Insider webinar, we will discuss how staffing agencies can prepare for the insurance hard market which is characterized by increasing rates, diminishing insurance options, and increased assumption of risk by staffing agencies. Here are some of the points Kurt and Jeff will cover. Actions every staffing agency must take in order to prepare for increasing workers' compensation rates. Understand workers' compensation program design options to find the program that best fits your company's risk profile and tolerance. Gain knowledge of industry best practices and benchmarking tools to assist with self-evaluation, and learn advanced risk management and loss mitigation techniques in order to minimize workers' compensation claims. By the end of the session, you will have gained the tools and knowledge necessary to be pre prepared for the hard market and be able to gain market share and increase your profits. If you have questions during the presentation, Please utilize the chart feature located on the right toolbar and submit questions to our panel. After the presentation, there will be time for questions and an opportunity for you to give us your feedback on today's webinar by completing a short exit poll. I now turn the floor over to Jeff and Kurt. Meg, thanks for that great introduction. Um, as Meg said, what we want to try to what we're going to cover today in, in this session is the, the changing workers' comp marketplace, some of the difficulties that, that you're going to be facing as staffing agency owners and some of the difficulties we're going to be facing as a, as a brokerage community to try to um, find you cost-effective solutions. And then more importantly, what it is that you can do as an agency owner in order to prepare your business for this and, and tech strategies in order to, to mitigate those costs going forward. So our agenda for today... We're going to cover these topics. What is a hard market? Why is a, why is a hard market here? What could be done to manage your costs? Some potential program design options? And then we'll summarize actions at the very end of the presentation today. So first start off with defining what a hard insurance marketplace is. It's defined by decreasing capacity, increasing rates, stricter underwriting guidelines being imposed by those insurance companies that remain in the marketplace. Forced increase in risk retention, and we'll cover that topic in a little bit more detail um, in the future. And then insurance companies typically will get out of the very tough classes of business to underwrite. For insurance industry, the tougher classes tend to be construction, mining, and agricultural business, long-term care like nursing homes, uh, retirement living communities, and then unfortunately for you, staffing. On the, regarding the decreasing capacity, for those of you that have not heard that term before, Essentially, what that comes down to is the insurance companies 
think of them uh, in terms of a bank, in terms of only having so much money to place in, within certain classes of business, or certain types of business, certain lines of coverage. And what happens is the insurance market right now is not profitable, believe it or not. And what that means is they will either take their capacity and move it to different lines of coverage, or they'll get out of it, or they'll do different things with it. So it means that there's less dollars to go out to provide insurance to those in the marketplace, meaning you folks. So that that's the, the layperson's term, if you will, in terms of the capacity side. Specific to increasing rates, we all understand what that is. But the stricter underwriting guidelines, um, you've probably seen some of these up to this point, but some of the guidelines that are you're going to either experience yourself or um, should be ready for, prepared for, they'll limit the states that they're going to do business in. Some of the obvious ones, California is is one we see quite often, and very few carriers are willing to do that, but there are others now that are included on that list. Um, they'll be much more tight on how they look at your class codes, and we're going to talk about misclassification later in our presentation. Um, the carriers available, guaranteed cost programs, might only be, um, even a few years ago, it was six or eight. Now we're down to really two, three, or four, depending on your type of business. So those are some of the conditions that you're going to see within the next year or two, and we'll address more today as we get into this. Um, and those, <clears throat> excuse me, those differences will be different um, for light industrial versus IT firms versus medical firms. They'll also be different by size. So if your annual premiums in workers' comp are 50000 that may be very different than for someone who is, say, 250000 or 500000 So the insurance industry is, is their profitability is measured historically based upon what's called a combined ratio. Combined ratio measures the actual premium dollars an insurance company takes in in premium against what they actually pay out in claims and expenses. Because of investment returns that the insurance companies um, make on their, on their dollars invested, they can make money up to a combined ratio of about 105%. Meaning they're paying out a hundred and five. They're paying out a dollar five for every dollar five in claims and expenses for every dollar they bring in in premium. This chart here shows you historically, going back over the last ten years, what the underwriting combined ratios have been for insurance companies for workers' comp. If you look back to 2002, three, four, five, and six, it's a period of declining combined ratios to the point where insurance companies were historically money or at least break even. So that was a period of decreasing insurance rates. So it's, as the brokers came out to have the conversations with you, what you typically saw during that time period was declining rates. Even as the underwriting cycle, the profitability turned in 2007 and 8, you could see that the underwriting ratios, the combined ratios, were still to the point where insurance companies could make money. What's happened in the last three to four years is that the, the combined ratios have deteriorated such that the insurance companies are now losing money again, for workers' comp. Pricing tends to lag declining profitability by a couple of years. So in 2009, 10, 11, and then projected 2012 combined ratios are supposed to be up in the low 120 to 125 range. We'll get those numbers here in a couple of months. What that tells you is that they've been losing money now for the last four years. And at some point, the insurance companies do need to make a profit, as you do. So during the cycle, you'll start to see what we talked about earlier, increasing rates, decreasing capacity, et cetera. So, again, this just a historical perspective on what the underwriting results look like for the industry. And workers' comp is the worst performing of all um, insurance coverages at this point. So, we're defining this as a change for the worse. Unfortunately, it's not a change for the better. Just a you know, quick headline. Um, business insurance put out a white paper recently. The headline was Hard Market on the Horizon, outlining the dynamics of what the hard market would be uh, and why. The, the, the reasons why is the uh, rising combined ratios, which we discussed. The investment uh, marketplace right now is really driven by historically low interest rates. And insurance companies 
typically take very conservative investments because they need to protect capital. So as interest rates decline, their their profitability or their, their investment income declines. Um, so right now it's being marked by historically low interest rates. Cat losses, catastrophe losses are on the increase. It was a relatively quiet period during the mid 2000, you know, four, five, six, seven, and eight without a lot of catastrophic losses. That's changing now as some of the weather cycles are changing. Changing um, during the recession, exposures being payroll and sales were declining significantly, so the insurance companies were taking in less in the way of premium to offset the actual claims. And then stagnant economy is creating stagnant premium growth. Uh, you know, in a period where people are growing sales and payrolls by 20%, the insurance companies get 20% bumps in, in premium. Over the last five, six years, there's been no growth to, to stagnant growth. You know, the, and GDP is growing at less than 3% right now. So it's not lending to a lot of growth in premiums in the industry. A couple of headlines. AIG is pulling off $2 billion in workers' comp, more to come. That was a business insurance headline, meaning that AIG is the historically the largest underwriter of workers' comp premium for the staffing industry. This doesn't apply to just staffing, but in general, even AIG, who's been a stalwart of the industry, is, is, is now walking away from as much as $2 billion or more in, in workers' comp premium. Um, California workers' comp is at a crisis point. Uh, we know that over the last 18 months, California's put through roughly 40 to 45 percent in rate increase um, because insurance companies in the state still can't be profitable even with those significant increases. And more is to come. We've heard some indications of another 20 percent increase again this year. One of the reasons that you often hear about California, you, uh, we talk to our clients about California and they say, well, I don't have offices in California. Why do we care so much about California? California has almost 25% of the total workers' compensation premium in the industry. So when it is so remarkably unprofitable, it affects everyone. Um, not to the, it, it still can depend on your own personal experience in the state you're in, but it has a huge impact on what the carriers are doing in other states. And um, you'll often hear about California, but it's because it's such a huge piece of the pie. Okay, so now on to some of the things that, that you can do to prepare your business and, and mitigate cost increases as, as we go into this difficult cycle. Um, we believe that the most important two things that you can do as a staffing agency is are, are pick the right clients and pick the right employees. Easily said, hard to pull off. But the most important thing you can do is actually stop a workers' comp claim from, from happening in the first place. So how do we go about doing that? Customer selection is key to that. Um, and also working with the customers in order to make sure that those that you're working with operate safely and view safety as importantly as you do. So the customer selection process should be quite intensive, um, including looking physically at the operations of the client, um, seeing what they're doing from a safety standpoint themselves. How strong is their safety program? Do they view you as a partner? Are they, as my sec, our second point here says, is are they hiring you because they don't want to put their own employees in harm's way? Do they want to put your employees in the uh, hazardous job employment? So you need to understand that. It's also imperative that you regularly visit those customers that you're working with in order to do periodic site inspections. We recommend using a actual form which keeps those inspections in a very detailed uh, process so that you can look back historically and measure their progress in making, making their facility more safe. One of the things that we often hear from clients, the ones that have effective risk management programs, is that they're out, uh, especially in the light industrial world, they're out to see their clients at least on a weekly or biweekly basis. Um, in addition to that, it never hurts for you to make, we won't call them surprise inspections, but just we'll call them stop buys, where if you have one that just doesn't feel quite right, that you're making a point to just show up and make sure your people are doing what you've been told they'll do, especially maybe in an earlier relationship or one where you've had claims. Um, regarding those inspections, also 
um, as Kurt mentioned, is the form that you use. It, it's kind of twofold in that it verifies that you don't have, let's assume it's a salesperson who's out there who doesn't want to lose the client and may not understand the full picture of workers' compensation and those costs. Um, you'd have a written document that your person has filled out, completed, and it may or may not make sense later when you have a claim uh, as to how they completed it. And then, obviously, if you do have a workers' comp claim, other than a medical only, we recommend visiting the client site every single time. What's also important, too, is that your employees understand that it's okay for them to tell a customer of yours no. If you have an employee that's hired to be a janitor and they're asked to get on a forklift and move a forklift around the facility and they're not trained specifically for that placement, they should be telling that employer no, or that customer of yours no, and you should be notified of that immediately so that you can have the conversation with the customer about something like that happening in the future. All too many stories around the industry these days of people being hired to do one thing, but on a customer site, they're being asked to do something completely different, which leads to improper training or which leads to an accident because of improper training, improper orientation. You know, people up on ladders trying to pull merchandise off of top shelf, people climbing up on forklifts to change light bulbs. The hardest thing I think for the temporary employees while they're at a customer site is to say no because they're worried about potentially losing their job. But you as an owner need to be telling your employees that they have that right, they have that power to say no to, to those customers and to notify you immediately if anything like that happens. One of the other items we, from a time standpoint, weren't going to be able to get into too deeply today, but we'll mention it here. Um, regarding those situations where um, you have a client who has put someone in the wrong place uh, or an improper job, um, or maybe you have a client where you just don't have the greatest relationship at the beginning and, and you wonder how to manage that. This is where having a client contract can come into play in, in enormous proportions in terms of just making sure that you, they understand that they're going to be held to a certain standard when it comes to the jobs that your person is going to be working in, the fact that you might be able to subrogate against them if they act completely, completely out of character in what they should be doing. Um, and it allows for things like the site inspections and other things. On another call, we could we could talk to you individually regarding these types of issues if you'd like to do that. So second key point is, <clears throat> now that you pick the right customer, picking the right employees. So how do you screen? How do you how do you vet those employees? How do you onboard? It becomes vitally important in in, in today's world that you're doing the right things. So. I know you guys are pressed for time in order to get people on board. You'll get a call. You need 40 people at 8 o'clock in the morning, and it's 4 o'clock the night before. But you really do need to pick the right employees. Some of the tools that, that we think are important is complete a, a very thorough uh, interview of the, of the employee. You're going you're gonna to know a lot about that person from the 15 minutes that you'll spend with them. You know, these are not high-level interviews for CEO positions. You don't need to spend three hours, but certainly a 15-minute conversation with the, with the person to figure out what they're all about is important. Background checks, obviously, and pre-employment checks in, in there are important as well. Some of the companies, uh, some of our clients are using integrity testing today, and there are several integrity testing services out there. It's, uh, it's, a, it, it's a test that you give employees post, I'm sorry, pre-hire, pre-interview, pre that is used to screen for those employees that are subject or, or uh, have a propensity for workplace violence, for, for uh, stealing from an employer, for drug and alcohol abuse. Uh, it's also meant to screen out potentially those that may file fraudulent workers' comp claims. So the, the, the cost of those services can get expensive when you're, especially if you're talking about hiring thousands of people a year. But tests these days are what, Jeff? Somewhere between like 5 and $8 a, a person? Exactly. Yeah. So that's, that's one of the tools. Also, pre-employment drug screens are important. And then post-offer medical questionnaires are becoming more and more uh, commonplace these days. And certain states have, have restrictions on when you can and can't use post-offer medical questionnaires. And again, this is post-offer. It's not pre-offer. It has to be done on a post-offer basis because you can't make hiring decisions based upon an employee's response to whether or not they, they have a medical condition. But if you 
have a post offer medical exam and you've got a facility where you're going to have 50 people, and somebody says in their medical questionnaire that they've had a prior workers or prior back injury and they can't lift more than 30 pounds, you know you can't put them in a position that's, that they're going to be regularly lifting 50 pounds. So just another tool. We also recommend use, utilizing loss control and uh, loss prevention services for, for customers. You can do that with uh, your insurance company. There are outsource vendors. Uh, most brokers that specialize in this business also have loss control services available. Uh, there are online training libraries available as well. Assurance has re recently unveiled our risk management website which in addition to a lot of uh, information about the industry and, and, and services and discounts on, on certain vendor uh, services, it gives it, it also provides a learning management system. Um, most of our clients that are using that today are finding that very helpful to train not only their internal staff, but talking about training safety orientation for each of the new hires, uh, it's used for salespeople, for on-sites, for branch management, et cetera. And then we also recommend rewarding safety. You know, there are hundreds of potential safety incentive programs out there. Some are good. Some are awful. Uh, it's all a matter of what fits with your culture. But if you're looking for resources, we can, we can assist with, with, with those as well. One of the things that we've seen in rewarding safety is you can think of it in terms of we – seen clients get extremely innovative in this area. It, it can be something where it's rewarded all the way down to an employee basis. It's rewarded on a branch basis in terms of numbers of claims, or it's even tied to the branch's uh, bonus structure. There's nothing more powerful than impacting their pocketbook when it comes to getting them to listen to the owners and managing the work comp costs. Okay, so now what do you do if a claim occurs? Because claims are inevitable. <clears throat> you need to aggressively manage the claims that you do have. So this starts way beyond when the injury occurs itself. This has to do with understanding what the insurance company, your partner in, in your insurance program, what their underwriting or what their claims adjustment philosophy is. So we recommend interviewing insurance third-party administrators, um, and insurance companies as, as to how aggressive they will be with, with claim negotiations, denials, et cetera. You need to understand what their claims philosophy is. Uh, we also highly recommend setting up special handling instructions with the insurance companies when it's available. There are certain insurance companies that just won't do it. They won't respond, especially if your premiums are less than certain thresholds. But as you get larger, you have more and more control over that relationship. Everything from approval of increases in reserves to settlement authority to communication with with your claims administration team internally can be set up and negotiated ahead of time within the aggressively managing claims that the clients that we have that do this the best are those that probably first and foremost they develop a relationship with their adjuster um, get them to trust you, get them to the point where they're responding to you and your folks as quickly as possible, um, and, and get them to um, react as quickly as you can. The 24 hours after a claim occurs are probably the most critical, maybe 24 to 48 hours in terms of reporting it timely. It avoids the employees getting to an attorney. Um, also, I would recommend doing post-accident drug testing on anyone who's looking to file a workers' compensation claim. But ultimately, the relationship with that adjuster is going to be a key to your success in this area. And aggressively investigate claims once they do happen as well. You know, you need to get out and document what occurred on the, on, at the client's site to determine if it was potentially a fraudulent claim. If it goes unwitnessed, if it's Monday morning injury, you know, you guys know the triggers. And when it occurs... Be as aggressive as possible with taking witness statements, with taking pictures of the facility, looking for video. A lot of your clients have have uh, cameras monitoring the activity of, of all, their, all their employees. If they have that, get it, preserve it, and save it for future use because it may be incredibly useful in denying a, a worker's comp claim. We also recommend having regular 
like Jeff said, having regular contact with the claims adjusters, um, which it also would include having regular and periodic claim reviews. Challenge the reserves. You got to get your broker involved. It's imperative that you have an, an advocating third party involved in, in those discussions. Your job is not to manage workers' comp claims. It is to run a staffing agency. The insurance company has their own agenda. You have your agenda, and you need somebody to advocate on your behalf, and that's what people like Assurance are supposed to do. We also recommend highly that you have light duty available for those that are injured. Um, statistic after statistic after statistic prove that getting people back to work is imperative in reducing the overall cost of the claim. People sit home and watch TV. They feel useless. They tend to get attorneys. If they're back at work, they're feeling productive. Um, they typically are you know, getting up every morning, showering, getting ready, going to work, and they really do feel like they're still part of the workforce. They're less inclined to get an attorney uh, than those that are sitting at home. So, you know, some, some statistics will say that it reduces the cost of the claim by as much as 30 to 40 percent. And then we're going to cover that last topic here a little bit later. So tracking profitability by client, I think, is, is a strong move that you can make. Uh, it could be the old 80-20 rule where 80% of your losses are coming from 20% of your customers. And there's a couple of different ways to track profitability by customer, and we're talking about profitability not only to the insurance companies but to you as well. Unhealthy... Unhealthy customers lead to increases in the overall cost of your insurance program. And if you can isolate your losses to one, two, three, four customers of yours, then, then you know, we know where the problem exists. It probably doesn't exist with the bulk of, of your customer relationships. It probably rests in just a handful of customers. So then the question is, what do we do with those customers? You know, do you terminate the relationships? Do you try to rehabilitate them? Um, there's all kinds of things you can do including increasing your markups on that particular customer to cover the cost of the claim. And if you can take those results, if you can show that your customer where they are causing your overall insurance in, uh, premiums to increase, may be very helpful in you being able to negotiate higher rates for them or getting them to, to recognize the fact that they are the problem with your insurance program and they tend to get more, more uh, cooperative at that point. One of the difficulties that people have that – are just getting into workers' comp and better understanding it, the question we've had before is, how do I know if it's profitable or not? So for those of you that are really just starting this process or looking to just start this process, one of the things that you can do is take a calendar year or a an insurance policy year for a client, determine how much premium you were charged for having that client, and then look at the losses that you've had for them and do it over a couple of years. One year shouldn't make or break you, but at the end of the day, what you should expect is that the total premiums that you were charged, they should have less than half of that number in claims, significantly less than half, but as a rule, absolutely less than half. And if it's over that number, most likely it's a, an unprofitable client for you. Um, one that you need to either consider terminating or make some changes like Kurt was outlining. So one of the things you can do if you determine that, that you still want to continue to do work with a customer but they are causing a, a disproportionate number of claims is take that, take that one, two, three, four customers off of your main workers' comp program and move it off to a separately insured uh, workers' comp policy. You could do that through any number of different means. A lot of times we end up putting that, that policy in the state assigned risk pool. Obviously, it's going to have an increase in rates over what you're currently paying. But again, if you're, let's just say, historically you've been paying $300,000 of workers' comp premiums, if you're going to suffer a 20% overall increase in your workers' comp program because of an unprofitable customer to the insurance company, you could be looking at a $60,000 increase. In, in overall workers' comp premium. But if you take that one customer, isolate them off, we can show the underwriters that, okay, the bulk of the claims are coming from this customer. We're no longer insuring that customer through this workers' comp program. We can historically go back and remove those claims, remove that payroll, and show them that overall, otherwise, it's it's been a profitable relationship. 
if you take that customer and throw it off in the assigned risk pool, you maybe you see a five or six, maybe $10,000 increase, but you're preserving the balance of the good workers' comp program. It may end up saving overall you know, tens of thousands of dollars over what the cost might have been. All right, so also quite important is making sure you're using the right workers' comp classifications for your customers. Staffing is a unique business in that most, most insurance buyers have two, three workers' comp codes on their policy. You as a staffing agency use the workers' comp code assigned to the operations of your customer. So some of you probably have 100 or more workers' comp codes on your policy. Making sure you're using the right workers' comp code is hugely important in the overall determination of what your premiums are. There are subtle differences in the descriptions of the workers' comp classifications that are potentially used, but it could mean a difference of five, ten dollars in rate, you know, five or ten dollars per hundred in, in rates. <clears throat> so it stands now, the NCCI, which governs operations in about 35 states, uses 600 different workers' comp classes. You know, for you to be able to, to manage that, it's incredibly difficult because you need to know the ins and outs of all the classification manuals. States like California, Delaware, Pennsylvania, Michigan, and Wisconsin, among others, have their own classification manuals. So you just add on more and more. Ultimately, there's, there's more than 2,000 workers' comp codes available around the, around the country. So you need to rely on somebody who understands the workers' comp me classification mechanism which may be the state regulator, which might be the insurance underwriter, which, which likely means your broker should be involved in helping you make these decisions. Gents, if I could step in, there's a question from Steve uh, on the call, and his question is, how do you split off certain customers from the main policy? Oh, good, good question, Steve. Um, it entails actually setting up a separate entity. So you'd have to have a separate federal ID number to move that particular customer to. So if you've got ABC staffing, is your main operations, you'd have to set up a separate company with X, XYZ staffing, for example, with a separate EIN. The reason being is that the workers' comp programs are purchased and underwritten based upon your employer ID number. So we could not put two workers' comp policies in place in the, in the same state for the same employer. We'd have to have a separate entity. Hopefully that answers your question. And if you have further questions about it, you can certainly give either Jeff or myself a call. Uh, one point on here is you, the last thing is you need to really focus on classifying the, your operations appropriately. Our risk management website, staffingrm.com, actually has a lot of classification uh, procedures and education on it. So if you want to check that website out, there's a, one of the tabs on there for classifications. You can go to that, and there's a lot of free information on there. Some of what's on there is only accessible to current clients, but there's also some educational materials on there that are uh, free for the taking. One of the uh, things that we mentioned earlier was that the insurance industry is really forcing the insurance buyers to take risk. So we want to take a few minutes here and talk about the different types of program design options for you as a, as a staffing agency. Uh, because as you move the underwriters further and further away from the day-to-day -day claims of frequency, your overall cost of your insurance decreases, but it becomes uh, more driven by your actual claim results than premiums. So the first and the, 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 the first stepping stone for most is what's called a guaranteed cost or first dollar workers' comp policy. It, it's what a lot of you are purchasing today, where you are paying a fixed rate per hundred dollars of payroll. Uh, and that varies only based upon the workers' comp classifications that are that are used in your payroll within the state. It's pre-negotiated up front. Um, there's some benefits to that. Coverage is available in all states. There's no collateral or letters of credit necessary, and you have a defined risk. So you know your rates at the beginning of the year. You know your rates at the end of the year. None of that changes. Obviously included within that is your experience modification as well. One of the things that we're going to talk about as we go through these different design options are um, there are different premium thresholds in terms of um, what type of program might be available to you and your company. Uh, those thresholds can also differ based on the type of placements that you do. So 
a lot of obviously what we're refu referring to here throughout our presentation are for the light industrial folks. Um, so I'll give an example on the guaranteed cost side. A minimum premium that the few carriers that are left are really looking for on the light industrial side is about 100000 in annual premiums. Now, there are a number of caveats within that. It depends on your state. There are different carriers throughout the country, et cetera, et cetera. But that's a very loose, general um, number that we would give you. But if you're doing just IT placements, that's, there's virtually no minimum premium if that's exclusively what you're doing. Medical staffing might be different. It depends. There are some programs out there for that. Um, you might be able to get that done at, at a 50000 or more minimum premium threshold, but we'll talk about those premium thresholds as we look at each of these designs going forward. Step up the risk ladder a little bit is what's called a dividend program. These are really difficult to find these days if they exist at all. Uh, we're mentioning it only because it is a program that has historically been available. Essentially, you're paying in the same sort of premiums you would pay with a guaranteed cost plan that we just mentioned. With the exception of if your if your overall claim results are below a certain threshold at the end of the policy year, the insurance company will give you money back. You'll never have to pay more than what you've agreed to pay up front, uh, but the potential exists to get, you know, most dividend plans if if they're uh, they're not hugely rewarding, but you might get up to 20 or 25 percent of the premium back, which is certainly better than not getting anything back. So for those of you that have good loss histories, premiums. 250 and above. Yeah, yeah, that would be a good number to to <clears throat> guess at. The the only um, market that I can tell you is really providing dividend plans is exclusive to the state of Texas is Texas Mutual. Um, other than that one, uh, I I really don't believe you're going to find that option. Or if you do, please call us because we'd be curious <laughs> <laughs> who's offering that. Uh, Maine actually does too. Their okay. their state fund does too. <laughs> So the other 48 states, if you find one, let us know. <clears throat> All right, next step up the risk ladder is what's called a retrospectively rated plan. Uh, this is one that actually your premiums will fluctuate based upon your actual loss results. So you'll historically pay premiums into a program like this equal to what the guaranteed cost premiums would have been. However, six months after the policy expires, the premiums are then ultimately adjusted upwards or downwards based upon your actual claims. Typically, about 35% of the premium dollars are allocated to cover fixed costs. So those are monies that you'll pay to the insurance company that are that they're going to use to cover their fixed expenses. 65, 70% of the premium is allocated to cover your loss dollars. So if you're looking at, historically, if your loss ratio is less than 70%, something like this might make sense. Minimum premiums? We're looking at probably 500000 on an annual basis in minimum premium for a retro. Sometimes you can get it less than that. There are a couple of players who were in this market for a long time who have either stopped being involved in staffing or are not doing anything new in this area. So it's actually becoming a fairly limited marketplace for retros, but um, depending on your size, depending on uh, your loss history, we still might be able to find something for you in this area. So it's another question from Steve, actually. Um, who writes that type of program for light industrial? What type of, which type are we done guaranteed cost? Or? Yeah, Steve, I'm sending you a chat here quickly to ask that question. Okay. Well, let's get it. We'll answer it in general. He said retro. Retro? Yeah. In general, people writing insurance for the industry these days, that there's, there's kind of two main players, and that's AIG and Zurich. Aside from that, a lot of the... A lot of what we do as brokers is is kind of one-off deals with underwriters. You know, we we have relationships with a lot of insurance companies. We use probably overall about 15 insurance companies, 15, 18 insurance companies today to underwrite our temp staffing business. Um, a lot of the companies we work with, they, they'll write a handful, two, three, or four deals for us um, only because of the strength of, you know, what we do as a broker with, not only the relationships we carry with the insurance companies, but also a lot of the risk management services and, and education that we're able to provide to to our customers. So, Stephen, answer to that question. It's, uh, there are a lot of one-off deals that, that we do, and I can't we can't really say with a broad brush that any particular insurance company is going to going to write these on a regular basis. The one that was doing it that Jeff referred to earlier pulled out of the staffing market about six months ago, 
and they were writing it for us in about what 18, 18 20 states at that yeah. time. Yeah, and 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 one that many of you ha- would know because they're the largest writer of work comp is Liberty Mutual, who um, stopped doing new staffing companies about I don't know five six years ago. They still do some. Um, they still do them on a retrospective basis, and um, but but again, they won't do any new. And to clarify, um, for Steve, he asked if if Chartus, Chartus and AIG are the same. We we just got used to calling it Chartus <laughs> when they switched back to AIG. So um, that's retro plans for you. And you know the benefits are if you're if you have good claims, it's going to be rewarded. There may not be a necessity for collateral or letters of credit, depending upon how you structure the program. Sometimes a retrospective plan will require collateral, so it's it's individually determined. Um, you've got to define risks, so, so there's, it's it's defined on the potential upswing, meaning additional premium, as well as on the, the downswing. So you just need to measure whether or not it's it's beneficial to you to to, to move forward with a program such as that. Up the risk ladder, large deductible plans. Uh, typically, when we say large deductible, we mean in excess of you assuming the risk up to or at least $250,000 per claim and above. So you really need to be of significant size in order to entertain a program such as this. Um, typically, we see it those companies that are running no less than $25 million in payroll, but you know, really, it's realistically, you've got to be generating at least about a million dollars in premium in order to entertain a program like this. So there's some benefits to it. The cash flow is better because historically you're paying the insurance company just a portion of the, of the overall, what would have been your overall premium, which usually runs again about 30, 35% of your premium. But then you have to reimburse them monthly for the actual claims that, that they pay out on your behalf. Um, again, up to that predefined threshold of, let's just say two, $250,000 per claim is the most typical deductible amount we see, but we've got clients with deductibles as, as much as a million dollars per claim. At large deductible plans, as we as we go up the ladder, like Kurt had mentioned, um, th- this is not for someone who's uh, faint of heart. I mean, there's serious risk involved here. You have to be completely comfortable that your risk management program is as tight as you can, can get it, um, comfortable with the risk, comfortable with the clients have, comfortable with, uh, the contracts that you have in place, and in addition to all of that, you have to understand that on a large deductible plan, you're you're really changing from an insurance program to really more of a financial risk is all that you become to the insurance company. So, um, the the biggest issue that they're going to have is if you were to not reimburse them for the claims that you're handling. So oftentimes the requirement that you'll see are true audited financial statements. When we say audited, we're talking they sit in your office for a week um, and and do that type of a statement or reviewed statements are a lot of carriers will accept that. If if you only have internal statements or just a compilation done by your CPA, you may not even be able to get a quote within this range. You are a financial risk that in today's day and age, you have to be a really good financial risk to be able to get coverage. And then really high up in the risk spectrum is uh, something that's incredibly rare for the staffing industry especially, but that's pure self-insurance. So people talk about being self-insured, and typically that means that they're taking large deductible plans. But there is a possibility that you get self purely self-insured, which means that you have to be an improved self-insured in each state in which you operate. So you have to go to each department of insurance within the state that you're operating and get approval to operate as a self-insured. It doesn't mean that you're taking unlimited risk. You're still going to be forced by the state to buy reinsurance above a predefined level, and that's going to be determined by the state itself. Um, again, typically we see self-insureds with um, assumption of risk at least a half a million dollars per claim and above. So that's why we say it's another step up because you're not buying reinsurance at $250,000 per claim. You're typically buying it at, at a half a million to a million dollars per claim and above. Um, requires that you go out and get certain service providers, including an, an accountant, an attorney, a third-party administrator to handle your claims, et cetera. And the, the state requires that you actually have a licensed third-party administrator on the program as well. So this is really rare, like in the state of Illinois, where Jeff and I are domiciled, 
typically have, what, two or three, four self-insured staffing agencies in the entire state. All right. We also recommend that you use a broker that knows this business. <clears throat> um, as Jeff and I talked about earlier is, you know, we have relationships with underwriters and they'll do deals for us that, that typically they're, they're not doing for other brokers because of our space and uh, volume within this industry. We know the industry. We know the buyers. We know how to help you. Um, the underwriting community recognizes the fact that that is important because we help protect them in the process in addition to keeping your cost down. So, and you guys have a lot, beyond workers' comp, there's a lot of other insurance issues that, that, that go into providing coverage for you, including a lot of contractual risks you take, which we're really not here to talk about today. That's a whole other hour webinar. So, you know, we're set up to hand, handle the day-to-day -day service needs. You know, we can help you with classification assistance, uh, contract review, claims advocacy, um, audit review. We're, we're, at this point, disputing probably 70% of the audits that come through our office are are argued with the insurance company because of improper assignment of payroll or misclassifications. Um, our safety department knows this industry. We can help you set up programs. We can help you loss control at your actual individual client site. Um, you know, our staffing risk management portal that we mentioned earlier, it's set up solely for the staffing industry and, and the, the services and offerings on there are specific to this industry. So know who you're dealing with. And within that, um, there, the change in this hard market, this is where you're going to see your broker do the best work for you. Um, we've had some deals in the last few months or even nine months to a year where holding that increase to 10% or 12% has been a huge win in comparison to where the underwriters are coming out of the box. So um, just work with someone who knows the industry. It will put you miles ahead. All right, last piece of advice is don't necessarily buy the cheapest insurance policy. Cheap being defined as the lowest cost up front because there's a lot of things that go into the long-term cost of your workers' comp policy. If you're, if you're buying insurance from an insurance company that doesn't have services, that, doesn't, that has a very lax posture on claims, um, that doesn't provide you with safety services, ultimately the cost of your program will, will be higher in two years than it is today. If let's just say you had an option to spend three or five percent more to get with an insurance company that gets this industry, with a broker who understands this industry, we and they will probably be able to help you save <clears throat> exponentially more than that over the cost of of the relationship or over the time of the relationship. Um, you know, our, you can see all the points on there about why it is important um, to look at the big picture when purchasing insurance. All right, so summary of what you need to do. Understand your workers' comp program and which structure is best for your business. Prevent the preventable claims. Once a claim does happen, get as aggressive as you can with managing those costs. Um, use, the workers, use the correct workers' comp classification. Utilize the right broker and then buy the right program. So overall, that is, that's really what we wanted to cover today. Um, we fielded a couple of questions during during the time that we've uh, been on the specific slides. If you have any other additional questions for us, go ahead and send those over via the chat feature. While we're waiting for that, one of the uh, questions that Kurt and I can discuss for a minute, <clears throat> the question that we get oftentimes is, of the clients who've had significant increases, over the past year, what were the key factors within that? Pro probably the biggest single factor is that obviously they were having poor loss experience. That's an easy answer, but there, there are other parts to that as well. Of all the things that we mentioned from a risk management program, if those things are not in place, it makes it very difficult to sit down with the underwriter and explain to them why living the increase or keeping them from non-renewing the account should be done. You need to be able to have a story behind why you've had some claims issues um, and, and an answer such as 
um, the claims were handled poorly by the carrier, just is it just doesn't cut it anymore. Some of those easy answers over the last few years, the underwriters just don't listen to that. So um, other than that, when it comes to keeping those increases at a minimum, uh, a big one is what Kurt had talked about in terms of, look, this client was obviously one that was unprofitable for us. We no longer have that client. Now you can remove that associated payroll and losses and have the underwriter look at your account significantly differently. Um, other factors within it would be who you have on staff to work with the carrier. You should sit down and meet with either the underwriter or the carrier prior to the renewal and their comfort level, not only with you as the owner, uh, maybe your financial condition, but also the people you have on staff can be huge pieces to getting your renewal done without the increases that your competitors are seeing. Question and, from Steve. Um, you want to repeat Steve, the question? Sure. Steve is asking if we think the ACA will change the work comp programs available over time. Um, you talk about a long webinar. We could really get into this if we went into a 24-hour product um, to where you, you provide a product that was covering not only the health and benefit side of the world, but also for them when they're on the job under workers' compensation. Um, <clears throat> th that marriage in terms of the carriers and in terms of all the factors involved in that, I was actually involved in designing what was a failed 24-hour product about 15 years ago. So I'm a little bit familiar with that. That is a very, very difficult product to put together. Um, I, I do believe, Steve, within your question where it could have an effect is if you have folks, let, let's assume you have someone who's working for you today that is out with one of your clients, and um, after the workday is done, they go home and are injured, and today maybe they don't have health care, and now after the Affordable Care Act in 2014, they do have that. Now they have a means to handle that type of situation, that injury, or, or whatever it may be, whereas maybe today they don't have health care coverage. And yes, I do believe that will have an impact on workers' comp in terms of improving the results that we're seeing. I'm not one of those, just in my own humble opinion, I'm not one where I think it will have an enormous impact on workers' compensation. Um, I believe that at the end of the day, when you're comparing the two, someone who files a claim under work comp has their medical taken care of for free, and they get paid, if they're off of work, two-thirds of their salary or hourly wage while they're out on that work comp claim. Oftentimes, the people who are filing those types of claims are very street smart and know that that's a better place for them. They don't really care which plan, if you will, it should go under. So not sure if I'm completely answering your question there, but those are kind of the initial thoughts off the top of my head. And uh, another question from Angela. As a small staffing firm with very limited exposure to claims, we are having a difficult time finding options other than assigned risk through state. Um, our work comp, or excuse me, work comp code is 8810 for our employees. Uh, we are shopping currently for our options, wondering if smaller firms are experiencing the same in terms of carriers in your experience. Uh, in working with your client? If you have just an 8810, so clerical or administrative exposure, um, there are there are actually some carriers that will do that down to virtually no minimum premium. Um, unless you have poor loss experience, which it does not sound like you have, um, we, we can easily help you with that. I believe we, we can find you at least one or, or more solutions for that issue. Yeah, as Jeff mentioned earlier, if you're placing clerical or IT medical um, staff, typically the minimum premiums are significantly less, and especially when you're doing solely work with engineers, architects, accountants, clerical, professional placements, we can get premiums down to three thousand dollars. I mean, it's it that, that's a fairly simple placement, assuming there are no claims. Nothing else right now. Anybody okay. else? We um, sincerely appreciate everybody's time. We, we appreciate Tricom for hosting the webinar today and allowing us the opportunity to present to you. Um, if you have any questions, both Jeff and my contact information is, is up on the screen. So you can feel free to reach out to either one of us and we'd be 
happy to address uh, whatever questions or concerns you have. Uh, Meg, we'll turn it back over to you. Unmute you, Meg. Here you go. Sorry, Meg. Your I'd like to it's thank the participants as well as Jeff and Kurt for sharing their knowledge. Um, again, contact Jeff or Kurt if there's any assistance you need. Thank you.